In this video, we're going to go over card evolutions that are essentially better versions of their normal monster counterparts. And at number 10, we have the Celtic Guardian. This is a normal monster with only 1400 attack, and briefly saw competitive play when it was the highest attack level 4 lore monster in the game, for like less than a month in the OCG. But in the TCG, it came out alongside cards like La Jin, the Mystical Genie of the Lamp, so it was already power crep right out the gate and didn't see any play. About two years after its release, they created an evolution of Celtic Guardian called Obnoxious Celtic Guard. This card had the exact same stats as the original, except it had the added caveat where it could not be destroyed by battle with the monster with 1900 or more attack. And you'd think with how early in the game this effect came out that it would be pretty good. Except there was already cards in the game like Spirit Reaper, a card that's permanently immune to battle destruction. And if you wanted to play a card that couldn't be destroyed by battle, there wasn't a big reason to play Obnoxious Celtic Guard over Spirit Reaper. Although in Duel Links it does see play because there aren't really better options. Although, that wasn't all. Twelve years later, Konami released another evolution of Celtic Guardian in the form of Celtic Guard of Noble Arms. This card has 2100 attack for a level 4 monster, which is actually really high even in the modern day. But because of its high attack, it has a restriction on it, where it can't attack if you have any cards in your hand, which is pretty bad. But it goes on to have two other effects, where you can special summon a Celtic Guard monster from your hand once per turn, and if this attacking card inflicts battle damage to your opponent, you get to draw cards equal to the number of Celtic Guard monsters you control. So if this card inflicts any battle damage by itself, you get to draw at least one card, which is actually pretty good. If you have a full board of Celtic Guard monsters on your side of the field, of which there is only three of them, you can draw up to five cards if it gets its effect off. So it has the potential for a high payoff, and even loosely has support with Noble Arm cards, just not in a useful way. Although, seeing as Celtic Guard of Noble Arms came out in 2016, where the meta was way past the point of attacking over things, or being able to special summon weak monsters from your hand, it didn't really do enough to allow Celtic Guardian to see any play. And at number 9, we have Curse of Dragon. This is a level 5 normal monster with 2000 attack, which actually made it one of the higher attack 1 tribute monsters in the early game, being being out by only like 2 other cards which meant it didn't see any play, because there was no use to use this card over something like Summon Skull. But then, 14 years later, it was given an evolution, in the form of Curse of Dragonfire. For the same stats as the original, only having an actual effect, if the card was summoned, you got to destroy field spell cards on the field, and also once per turn it had the unique effect to allow you to perform a fusion summon, as long as you use monsters on your side of the field, including Curse of Dragonfire as one of those materials for the fusion summon. This card was also meant to be support for the Guy of the Fierce Night archetype, who also received a new wave of support including Sky Galloping Gaia Dragon Champion, as Curse of Dragon was involved in the fusion monster with Gaia the Fierce Knight in the form of Gaia the Dragon Champion. So Curse of Dragon Fire was supposed to allow you to bring out Sky Galloping Gaia the Dragon Champion easier, and it didn't really do a good job at that, because it was still a one tribute monster that was kind of hard to bring out. So Curse of Dragonfire only saw niche success in a handful of combos that wanted to bring out fusion monsters who could use Curse of Dragonfire as one of its materials, which almost never involved Sky Galloping the Gaia Dragon Champion. Then in 2020, it got a new and improved evolution, in the form of Curse of Dragon the Cursed Dragon. It has the same stats as the original, and has the effect that if summoned, you can add a spell or trap card from your deck to your hand that has Gaia the Dragon Champion in its card text. It also has another effect, that if it's sent to the graveyard, you can negate the effects of all of your opponent's monsters who have an attack less than a face-up Gaia Dragon Champion monster you control. So it still didn't have an easier way to bring itself out, but they did include an actual good new wave of support cards revolving around Gaia Dragon Champion, and the newest evolution form of that card, Gaia the Magical Knight of Dragons. Curse of Dragon the Cursed Dragon could actually be brought out a lot easier with this new support thanks to cards like Gaia the Magical Knight, who could special summon the card from the hand or graveyard, and Artillery Catapult Turtle, who could special summon it straight from the deck. The latest evolution of Curse of Dragon basically only exists to facilitate combos to bring out Gaia the Magical Knight of Dragons, but it at least does a better job of it than the original retrain did, even if it's not quite good enough to see play in the modern metagame. And at number 8, we have Mystical Elf. This is a level 4 monster with only 800 attack but 2000 defense. And because it has such a high defense value, it did actually see play as a wall that could reliably survive until your next turn, so that you could tribute it for a good card like Summon Skull or Jinzo. Then, only a couple months after the release of the card, it received an evolution form, or more likely a dark version, 
which are a series of cards that I'll probably have to do a separate video on in the future, where its dark counterpart had its attack and defense swapped, and had the effect that you had to pay 1,000 life points for it to declare an attack. But since that's not really a big deal, and it was a 2,000 attack level 4 monster, it actually saw a lot of competitive play. This was in the time period where the highest attack for a level 4 lower monster was 1850, so Dark Elf could beat over pretty much anything, and all he had to do was pay 1,000 life points each time he declared an attack. Which in today's metagame, where life points are seen as more of a resource to use rather than something to covet, that seems like not a big deal at all. But in the early days of the game, things were a lot more control oriented, and they kind of paid attention to life points more than we do today. So it was only really played at one copy per deck most of the time, because people didn't want to pay all those life points for just a low level beater. Although, deck building back in the day was kind of weird. They didn't actually play three ofs very often, and they would routinely play one or two copies of key cards. So it was more of how deck building was back then, than how life points were more valued back then. And probably just how bad deck building was in the early days of Yu-Gi-Oh. Because remember, cards like Solemn Judgment did not see widespread competitive play when it first came out, because people didn't want to have to pay half their life points to use it even though it's one of the best trap cards in the game's history and still sees competitive play to this day. Eventually, the game moved away from having high attack beaters, and Dark Elf quickly fell out of favor, but it was a powerhouse in the early days of Yu-Gi-Oh! And at number 7, we have Summon Skull. This was the strongest one tribute monster in the early version of the game, clocking in at a grand total of 2500 attack, which was the same attack points as the Dark Magician, who required two tributes to be brought out and a lot of early versions of decks were just Summon Skull beatdown. Although once the game started to transition into archetypes, Summon Skull kind of stopped seeing play like most normal monsters that weren't also part of archetypes. Even though Summon Skull is technically part of the Archfiend archetype, Summon Skull went on to get a retrain pretty early on. After only a year, Skull Archfiend of Lightning was released, another 2500 attack level 6 monster, this time with an actual beneficial effect on top of it, where if this card is targeted by a card effect, you get to roll a 6-sided die, and if the result is 1, 3, or 6, you get to negate the effect and destroy that card. So basically, you had a 50% chance to negate and destroy cards that targeted it. But it also had a maintenance cost like most of the early Archfiend cards, where you had to pay 500 life points during each of your standby phases to keep it on the field. It wasn't very good, but it was better than nothing, and didn't really see any competitive play. Then, in 2009, about six years later, Summon Skull received a zombie version called Archfiend Zombie Skull, which required Plague Spider Zombie plus two or more non-tuner zombie monsters as its materials. And what you got for this kind of ridiculous requirement for a level 6 synchro monster was a card that granted your zombie monsters the effect where they could not be destroyed by card effects. And this card didn't see any competitive play in its intended way, but did actually see play once Shiranui's Spectral Sword was released in 2016 and basically allowed you to cheat the card out of the extra deck. Then, in 2005, during a new wave of Red Eyes Black Dragon support cards, they released a card called Red Eyes Archfiend of Lightning, which was a Gemini card that actually had a pretty good effect if you managed to get off its Gemini summon, where you could destroy all the cards in the field with a lower defense than this card's attack, which was a homage to the support spell card Makiu, the Magical Mist, although it didn't really see competitive play, because Red Eye decks didn't see competitive play outside of Duel Links. And of course, outside of using single copies of Red-Eyes Black Dragon and Red-Eyes Fusion in order to bring out Red-Eyes Dark Dragoon. Although in 2019, Konami released a series of new evolutions of Summon Skull, comprising of different versions of it for each monster type, as Summon Skull was given a Ritual, Synchro, Fusion, and XC's counterpart, all of them having various different effects that revolved around protecting themselves in some way, or boosting attack but they all shared basically the exact same stats of being a level or rank 6 monster, the same attack and defense as the original Summon Skull, and the floating effect that if the card is sent to the graveyard by an opponent's card, you got to special summon a Summon Skull from your hand deck or graveyard. Now, none of these new wave of Summon Skull cards saw competitive success either, although Archfiend's Call, the Synchro Summon Summon Skull, does actually see competitive success in Duel Links at least, because it can't be targeted by card effects and is pretty easy to bring out. But even though Summon Skull has a whole bunch of retrains and evolutions of the original card, none of them saw anywhere near as much success as the original card in its prime, when it was basically in everyone's deck, which is why it's kinda low on this list, even though it's so iconic and was so good in the early days of the game, because almost all of its evolutions have been kind of a disappointment. 
And at number 6, we have Battle Ox. This card occasionally saw play in the early days of the game because it was a high attack level 4 lower monster and came out in the first set of the game. It wasn't the highest attack, but it was tied for the second highest with Neo the Magical Swordsman. So once bigger and better beaters came out, Battle Ox quickly stopped seeing play, and then two years later, its evolved form Enraged Battle Ox came out. Enraged Battle Ox has the effect that while it's on the field, all of your beast, beast warrior, or wing beast type monsters gain piercing battle damage. And hey, what do you know? Enraged Battle Ox himself is a beast warrior type monster, so it also just gained piercing battle damage. And it actually saw a lot of competitive play alongside cards like Air Knight Parsha, a level 5 monster with 1900 attack, who saw a lot of competitive success because it had piercing battle damage and a high attack, while also being able to draw cards if it did inflict that battle damage. Enraged Battle Ox only had 200 less attack than Air Knight Parshath and didn't require a tribute, so it was just a very good addition to those kinds of decks, even though most of them were used in Chaos decks that were all about light and dark monsters. The stat line for its piercing damage was so good that they would play an earth monster like Enraged Battle Ox just to get that piercing damage, which allowed them to deal with battle immune monsters like Spirit Reaper pretty easily, who were pretty dominant at the time. Although this didn't last long and stop seeing play with the gradual power creep of the game. And at number 5 we have Ansatsu. This is a level 5 vanilla monster with 1700 attack, the same attack as Battle Ox, and didn't really see any play because there's no reason to tribute a monster for the same stats as a Battle Ox. It was already not even the strongest level 4 lower monster in the game at the time. Then two years later, Strike Ninja came out, which is a direct evolution of the original card, as it has the exact same stats as the original, except it's a more reasonable level 4 monster instead of level 5, which means you can bring it out without tribute summoning. And what Strike Ninja did was it has a quick effect, where you can banish two dark monsters from your graveyard in order to banish this card until the end phase. So it was kind of like Wind Up Rabbit or Evil Swarm Thunderbird, or you could use this effect to dodge destruction effects in order to keep it around longer. Although it had a much harsher condition of having to banish two monsters from your graveyard to do this. Whereas Rabbit and Thunderbird can do it with no cost. And as surprising as it might be to hear, Strike Ninja absolutely saw tons of competitive play. And even had decks built around it. You see, shortly after Strike Ninja came out, a trap card called Return from the Different Dimension was also released. This card allows you to pay half your life points to special summon as many of your banished monsters as possible, but during the end phase, all of those monsters are banished again. So, using Return from the Different Dimension, as well as Dimension Fusion, what you could do was rely heavily on Strike Ninja's effect in order to fill up the banish zone, so that you can go for a big win with one of those two little cards. And they could do this pretty easily because basically all of the best floaters were Dark Attribute, and they could just rely on cards like Mystic Tomato and Sangen to fill up the graveyard while searching out more cards from the deck. And then they would just use Strike Ninja to get rid of all those cards from the graveyard so they could be brought back later on for a finish. And this deck saw all kinds of competitive success, all the way until Dark Arm Dragon came out. Dark Arm Dragon was a center stone of one of the few tier 0 decks in the game's history, and has the effect that you can special summon it from your hand if you control exactly 3 dark monsters in your graveyard, and it can destroy one monster in the field by banishing one dark monster from the graveyard, which is not once per turn. So Strike Ninja allowed you to better control the number of dark monsters in your graveyard, and kind of just worked alongside Dark Arm Dragon decks that were using Return from the Different Dimension as well. Although Dark Arm Dragon was so good at using Return, as well as the new Synchro Monsters coming out that allowed you to turn all those monsters of the field into Synchro Monsters rather than letting them get banished, that they eventually banned Return from the Different Dimension, and with the banning of that card, Strike Ninja stopped seeing play. And that was kind of the end of it. Later on, they also released a new ninja support card called Black Dragon Ninja, which could be loosely considered another evolution, since it kind of has the same ninja outfit in the picture, but that card only saw competitive success in Duel Links and doesn't really have much to do with Strike Ninja's effect. And at number 4, we have Archfiend Marmont of Nefariousness. This is a level 2 vanilla monster with incredibly low stats and obviously didn't see any competitive play. Then, 5 years after its release in the TCG, an evolution version of the card came out called Obese Marmot of Nefariousness, which is a level 3 vanilla monster with 350 more attack, which also saw no play because it's kind of bad for a level 3 monster as well. It wasn't until 2014 until we saw a good evolution of the card in the form of Nefarious Archfiend Eater of Nefariousness. This later one was a level 4 monster and had an actual effect, where if you controlled a spellcaster type monster you could special summon the card from your hand. 
This was in effect given to all the Charmer companion evolutions, as the original card can be seen alongside Ayusa, the Earth Charmer. So sometimes when they release new Charmer support, Archmean Marmot of Nefariousness would also receive some support. Anyways, it goes on to have another effect, where during the end phase, if this card exists in your graveyard, you can destroy one face-up monster you control in order to special summon this card. Now, this effect can only be used once per turn in order to prevent any kind of infinite loops like with Manticore of Darkness, but even at only once per turn, it was actually really good in a whole bunch of decks that like to destroy their own cards, especially decks like Pepe, another one of the few Tier 0 decks in the game's history. They love to destroy their own cards, although they do such a good job at it that they don't really need nefariousness, but it was still useful and was included in a couple of Pepe decks that topped events. Once a lot of cards in that deck got banned, it kept seeing play in Performage decks because they love to destroy their own cards, and they gain even more benefit if they're able to do it during their opponent's turn. More recently, it saw play in a couple of Crusadia Guard Dragon decks, but not for its destroy effect, and actually because of the ability to special summon itself from the hand if there's a spellcaster type monster on the field. And of course it saw some play in Yang Xing decks who also love to destroy their own cards more than anything, since basically all Yang Xing monsters have the effect where they float into another Yang Xing monster if they're destroyed by battle or card effect. And at number 3 we have Warrior Digrapher. This monster didn't see play as a normal monster but did get a whole bunch of evolutions and retrains, more than probably even Summon Skull. Although, since he has so many of them, I'm only going to talk about the one that matters, and that's Dark Greffer. Who, again, might just be a dark counterpart and not technically an evolution, like Dark Elf, but it is a really good card and improves upon the original, so it counts for the list. Now, Dark Greffer has the effect that you can special summon the card from your hand by discarding a level 5 or higher dark monster. And then it goes on to have the effect where you can discard a dark monster in order to send a dark monster from your deck to the graveyard. For the longest time, this was kind of considered a worse version of Armageddon Knight, since the card can send dark monsters from your deck to the graveyard on its summon without a cost. Although Dark Greffer still saw play, because sending dark monsters to the graveyard was just so good, that usually decks would play Dark Greffer alongside Armageddon Knight, and it had the additional option of being able to special summon itself from the hand sometimes, especially if you discarded cards like Destiny Hero Malicious from your hand in order to bring it out, a card that wants to be in the graveyard anyway. The fact that it was a warrior also helped popularize dark warrior combos, which are really good in the Link era. Although it's not just dark warrior combos that make Dark Greffer good. It sees tons of play in all kinds of different decks. In fact, it's pretty much seen consistent play ever since it came out in 2008, to the point where they eventually had to limit the card during the Link era, because it was too good with Link monsters. So when it comes to evolutions, Dark Greffer is definitely high up there in terms of good ones. And at number 2, we have Three-Legged Zombies. This is a level 3 normal zombie type monster with 1100 attack, which didn't actually see competitive play when it first came out, which shouldn't be surprising considering its terrible stats. Although it eventually was given a random evolution in 2015 in the form of Unizombie. Unizombie is a level 3 tuner monster, which is surprisingly a little bit more attack than the original at 1300, and has two effects. One of them allows you to discard a card from your hand in order to increase the level of monster you control by 1. Its other effect allows you to send a zombie type monster from your deck to the graveyard to increase the level of a monster you control by one. Although if you use this effect, only zombie monsters are allowed to attack this turn. And each of these effects are hard once per turn. Now the fact that the card is a tuner, can manipulate its own level, and send zombies from the deck to the graveyard, means it has seen pretty much consistent play in any zombie deck ever since it was released. The fact that it has zero defense means it can be searched straight out of the deck with cards like Shiranui Solitaire and kind of allows you to have one card level 8 synchro monsters. As what you could do is normal summon Shiranui Solitaire, use its effect to tribute itself to special summon Unizami from the deck, then use Unizami's effect to send Mezuki from your deck to the graveyard in order to increase its level by 1. Then use Mezuki in the graveyard to bring back Shiranui Solitaire, and you have two materials on the field for a level 8 synchro monster. Although this is just one of many ways you can use Unizami. The fact that it's a tuner also opens up Crystron how Quifferbax combos which adds all kinds of potential to the zombie-based decks. Although, when it comes to Unizombie versus Dark Graffer, technically, Dark Graffer has seen more competitive play, but only because Warrior decks have seen more play, whereas I think Unizombie technically is just a better card overall, which is why I have it slightly higher. And at number 1, we have Crowned by the World Chalice. This is a level 2 neural monster which was released in 2017, and was kind of made for the sole purpose to have evolutions of it created down the line even though the card itself does see competitive play every now and then because it's part of the World Chalice archetype. 
Now, Crowned by the World Chalice has a couple of evolutions, and pretty much all of them have seen competitive play. And she even has a couple of dark counterparts, or corrupted versions. But for this spot, we'll be talking about Ib, the World Chalice Justicier. This is a level 5 synchro monster who has the effect that you can synchro summon this card without a tuner monster if you control World Chalice Normal Monster, which you can treat as a tuner monster for its summon. Its summoning condition isn't super important, but the fact that it allows itself to be brought out easier when it already has two other good effects is just icing on the cake. You see, this card also has the effects that when this card is synchro summoned, you get to add a World Legacy card from your deck to your hand. And also, if this synchro summon card is sent from the field to the graveyard, you get to special summon a World Chalice monster from your deck or graveyard, except another copy of this card. This card itself is also a tuner, which adds even more versatility to the fact that this card basically allows you to go plus two with its effect. First, it allows you to search on its summon, which is an inherent plus one, or card economy neutral if you consider the two monsters needed for its synchro summon, and then you gain advantage when you use its material for something else. Usually a link summon, and the type of advantage it gives you is one of the best in the game being able to bring a monster out of the deck, directly to the field. And there are a couple of really good generic legacy support cards, like World Legacy Succession, which allows you to special summon a monster from the graveyard, just as long as it's to a zone that a link monster points to. Ib was basically pure advantage. It was easy to bring out since it had generic materials and was only a level 5 synchro monster. It had alternative summoning conditions, so it was easier to bring out. It allowed you to go plus 1 on its summon, plus 1 on its floating effect, and doubled as a tuner monster itself for even more versatility in how to get the card off the field to activate its floating effect. The card was so good at generating vantage that it got banned in the middle of Master Rule 4, before they loosened the restrictions on where synchro monsters could be summoned to. You know a synchro monster is busted when it's considered too strong for a restricted format like Master Rule 4. Now, Crowned by the World Chalice does have a lot of other evolutions, but none of them are as good as Ib the World Chalice just to share. So I think we'll just end it there. Alright, and that's the video. Are there any other card evolutions that I missed that should have been in the video? If so, I'd love to hear about them down in the comments, as well as ideas for future videos just like this one. And also, did you know only 36.1% of people who watch these videos are actually subscribed to the channel?